Hey everyone, it's low carb and keto nutrition specialist, Amy Berger, bringing you the one and only keto without the crazy. I've got a very long video for you today. And this is because it's a critically important topic and I don't want to shortchange you. I don't want to leave anything out that I think is really essential for you to know. So bear with me, this is going to be a long one. We're going to be talking about Alzheimer's disease. And if you are wondering what on earth a low carb and keto oriented nutritionist would have to say about Alzheimer's disease, you are about to find out. So let's get started. I've got slides and everything. This is gonna be the real deal. So let me share my screen and hopefully the technology gods will be with us and everything will go smoothly. Okay, here we go. They regularly refer to Alzheimer's disease as type three diabetes or diabetes of the brain. And if you've never heard those phrases before, don't worry, this entire presentation is designed to explain what that means and where it comes from. And if you are already familiar with this type of issue with Alzheimer's, you know, type three diabetes, I hope that what I show you today will be you know, furthering your knowledge and maybe explain things that you've heard but didn't really understand or that this just gives you a, a much deeper understanding than you already have. <clears throat> so I hope that this video gets shared far beyond my usual audience. So in case you are new to my channel, hello, or new to me and you don't know who I am, a very quick intro. I am Amy Berger. I am a CNS, which is Certified Nutrition Specialist. It's um, different from a registered dietitian, so I'm not an RD, but I do have graduate level training in nutrition. I am the author or co-author of three books, and you see them right there. The Alzheimer's Antidote was my first book, so not surprising that I'm here delivering a presentation about Alzheimer's disease. My second book was The Stall Slayer, which is dedicated to breaking those dreaded, miserable fat loss stalls on low-carb and ketogenic diets. And my most recent book is uh, End Your Carb Confusion, co-written with Dr. Eric Westman from Duke University. I have spoken at low carb and keto conferences in the US and internationally. I helped contribute to the curriculum that the American Nutrition Association uses to certify other CNSs. And I also um, recently ended my tenure on the committee that writes the exam, the, the board exam to certify other CNSs. So that is me in a nutshell. Now let's get into the topic that you are all here for. Of course, I just said I'm a CNS, so I'm not a doctor, I'm not a medical professional. Nothing that you will see in this presentation is intended to be medical advice or to replace advice that you are getting from your medical team and medical professionals. Okay. Let's look really quick at some of the statistics around Alzheimer's disease. It is a grim reality and grim is probably putting it politely. This is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. One in 10 people over age 65 is living with Alzheimer's. In the US, we've got almost 6 million people living with Alzheimer's and by 2050, Projections are that this will be about 14 million people. And that's just in the US. Uh, in the US also, um, in 2017, healthcare costs associated with Alzheimer's were 277 billion, billion with a B dollars. And again, by the middle of this century, this is projected to exceed $1 trillion. Between, now this data is a little bit old, but between the year 2000 and 2015, deaths from heart disease decreased 11%, while deaths from Alzheimer's increased 123%. So modern medicine is making great advances and great strides in certain areas, and Alzheimer's disease, sadly, is not one of them yet. Stick with me. Maybe we have a path out of the darkness. I want to talk to you about Alzheimer's disease as a metabolic condition. 
And when I say metabolic condition, I mean that it has to do with the way the brain uses energy. You're going to hear that word over and over again throughout this talk, energy or brain energy. Think of your brain like an energy hog. Your brain is a little piggy for energy. So depending on the source you cite, the brain, you, the, the brain accounts for about 2% of an adult's total body weight, yet it uses about 25 to 30% of all the glucose and oxygen. So this is one hungry organ up here, one very hungry organ. And all of these quotes that you will see throughout this presentation are taken from the published scientific literature. And I don't have the full citations here, but if you are curious about any of these, send me an email. Um, I'll, I'm gonna provide my contact form, at the, contact information at the very end of this presentation. So when the brain's energy supply is insufficient to meet its metabolic needs, the neurons that work hardest, especially those concerned with memory and cognition are among the first to exhibit functional incapacity, such as impairment of memory and cognitive performance. When the brain's energy supply is insufficient to meet its needs. Neurons, brain cells, neurons are largely intolerant of inadequate energy supply and thus the high energy demand of the brain predisposes it to a variety of diseases if energy supplies are disrupted. Although neurodegenerative diseases are not classically thought to be caused by disturbed metabolism, energy problems, bioenergetic defects are emerging as important pathophysiological mechanisms in several disorders. One of the earliest signs of Alzheimer's disease is a reduction in cerebral glucose metabolism. A reduction in cerebral glucose metabolism. We're gonna elaborate on that very soon. But I just wanna point out to you that this says, although neurodegenerative diseases are not classically thought to be caused by metabolic problems, this talk here is specifically about Alzheimer's disease, but I will be posting sometime in the next week or two, a talk that builds upon this. And I, I will be discussing Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, um, ALS, and some other neurological and neurodegenerative conditions. So if you are interested in those issues for yourself or a loved one, hang on, because that video is coming soon, but today is just Alzheimer's. Let's look at the basic structure of a neuron because it's kind of important for you to understand what these cells look like and you'll get a better idea of what the problem is and what's going wrong in Alzheimer's disease. So this, again, very basic, basic structure. This isn't, you know, to scale or anything. This is not a medical illustration, but a neuron has um, a cell body. You see that on the left, that sort of purple thing. That's the main part of the cell. And it's got these little projections coming out of it called dendrites. And then it has that long skinny projection covered in yellow. That's an axon. And the axon is covered in that yellow waxy substance called myelin. It's called the myelin sheath and it surrounds and protects the neuron. And the axon ends and you see those axon terminals. It's these, these other branches coming out of it. And the way that neuronal communication happens in, in a basic nutshell is that the, the axon of one neuron sends a signal, sends a transmission, a nerve transmission, and it is received by the dendrites of the other one. It's think of it like a radio station broadcasting and then the, the receiver receiving the signal. And so in order for that proper communication to happen, the neuron has to have the correct shape. The, you know, the axon has to be able to reach the dendrites of, of the next neuron. So you've got in healthy cells that have the, the correct structure, you've got something that looks like this, right? They don't exactly touch, but they're very, very close together. So that when it sends out a signal, it just has a tiny bit of distance to travel. And what happens in Alzheimer's disease is because the brain does not have enough energy it's basically starving for fuel. And it takes a lot of energy to maintain that very unique shape of that neuron cell. And so when the brain doesn't have enough energy and these neurons are starving, in order to conserve energy, to keep the cell body alive, to keep that main part of the cell alive, it will retract some of the axons and dendrites. I, I like to think of it 
like a vacuum with a retractable cord. So the neurons are kind of pulling in those axons and dendrites to conserve energy. So instead of something like this and connections and, and synapses, the synapse is the, the tiny, tiny space between the axons and dendrites. And get, this is not a medical illustration. This is just for you to get a general sense of what's happening here. When those axons and dendrites are receded back toward the cell body, instead of this, we have this. Well, no wonder those cells cannot communicate anymore. No wonder we have memory loss. No wonder we have personality changes and behavioral disturbances. Those cells literally are unable to communicate with each other anymore. And it's because there's an energy deficit. The cells are basically starving for fuel. So that's the issue there. And here, this is just a, a little close up of that synapse. You can see there on the right that in, in order for neuronal communication and nerve impulse transmission to happen, these set, that, that has to have the correct shape. And when it doesn't, we've got a major problem. If we're talking about energy, we've got to talk about mitochondria. Mitochondria, who remembers from high school biology class or maybe college biology that the mitochondria are what they call the powerhouses of the cell or the little energy factories inside your cell. And cells have many, many mitochondria. There's not just one in there. Some, some cells have, I think, thousands of them. Anyway, this is where the vast majority of energy in your cells is generated. A little bit is, is generated outside the mitochondria, but the, the lion's share of energy is created here. So if there's problems with the mitochondria, there's going to be problems with energy and with these cells communicating properly. If the amount of free radical species produced overwhelms the neuronal capacity to neutralize them, oxidative stress occurs followed by mitochondrial dysfunction and neuronal damage. Mitochondrial dysfunction and the resulting energy deficit trigger the onset of neuronal degeneration and death. The neurons are degenerating and dying because they do not have enough energy Alzheimer's is a metabolic disease. I said a little bit earlier that they regularly refer to Alzheimer's disease as type three diabetes. So where does this come from? Well, the predominant abnormality in late onset Alzheimer's disease is up to a 45% reduction in cerebral glucose utilization. 45%, don't you think? If your brain is using 45% less glucose than somebody else's brain, you might have some memory problems. You might have cognitive impairment. Of course you would with that, that big a fuel gap to your brain. I'd, how could you not have cognitive impairment when your brain is using almost less than half the amount of energy or the amount of glucose that a healthy brain would be using? All right, next up, progress in understanding changes in brain energy metabolism during aging, sorry, during aging and Alzheimer's has grown rapidly in the past three decades to the extent that it is now widely acknowledged that brain hypometabolism accompanies Alzheimer's disease. Brain hypometabolism. Hypometabolism means too little energy. And this, this paper is already you know, over 10 years old. And at that time, the author was saying that over the past three decades, it's becoming widely acknowledged that this is the problem. Three decades. Is this the first time you're hearing of this? I, I hope it's not. But if it is, it is an honor to be able to bring you this information. Because if you go to the Alzheimer's Association website, the last time I checked, there was not one single mention of this brain energy problem that is the actual un underlying fundamental problem in the disease. And there's crickets from the Alzheimer's Association. A prominent and well-characterized feature of Alzheimer's is progressive region-specific declines in the cerebral metabolic rate of glucose. 
the rate at which your brain is taking up and metabolizing glucose. So let's, let's parse this out. A, it's progressive. Nobody wakes up overnight with Alzheimer's disease, right? Nobody just wakes up one day with severe impairment. It starts as mild cognitive impairment or MCI, and it gets worse over time, right? That's what it means when it, we say it's progressive. And it's region specific, right? At first, in Alzheimer's disease, the whole brain is not affected. It's only certain regions. That's why in the very early stages, somebody just maybe is a little forgetful. They misplaced their keys. They, they can't remember a word. It's little things. It's only over time as the disease progresses and spreads that as that damage becomes so severe, that's that's when you start showing signs and symptoms. But And, and that's when you really lose the ability to conduct what they call ADL, the activities of daily living. That when it's really severe and widespread and it is affecting the whole brain, it's really no longer region specific, that's when you need assistance with bathing and dressing yourself and feeding yourself and these, these normal everyday living tasks. But it, it starts as region specific and it starts mild and it progresses. Reductions in the cerebral glucose metabolic rate are associated with increased Alzheimer's risk and can be observed years before dementia onset. We need to talk about just how critical a point this is. The reduced brain glucose metabolism is measurable in people as young as their 30s and 40s long before they have any signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's. Their, their brain is totally fine. They have no cognitive symptoms because they're still young enough and they're still robust enough and healthy enough that the brain is compensating. The reduced energy in the brain is already there, but their brain at that point is able to compensate so they have no signs and symptoms. It's only when this problem has gone on for so long and has become so severe that the brain is no longer able to compensate, that's when you start having signs and symptoms. But the thing you need to know is that by the time that happens, this disease process has been brewing for years and in some cases decades. This is not a disease of the elderly. It's not an old people disease. They used to joke and call it old timers disease, right? This is not only is it not old timers disease, there are people ever younger being diagnosed, right? They call it early onset Alzheimer's. You Maybe you yourself are afflicted with this, maybe a loved one or just somebody you know. People in their 50s and 60s are getting this now. And you could almost understand that somebody in their 80s or 90s might have a little bit of impairment. That You could accept that as maybe something that's inevitable when you are at that you know, seasoned an age. I don't like to say old, but when, when you are of that age. But 50s and 60s for this to be happening, something else is up, right? Something else has to be going on just like we are seeing ever and ever younger people being afflicted with type two diabetes, with metabolic syndrome. We've got toddlers now with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We've got teenage girls with PCOS. So we've got all of these metabolic problems afflicting people at ever younger ages. But I just wanna really critically emphasize that point that you don't wake up one day with Alzheimer's. This is something that is brewing for years and years and years. And by the time it actually becomes severe enough to have symptoms, you're actually already pretty advanced in the disease process. I don't believe in such a thing as mild cognitive impairment. If you have cognitive impairment, there's nothing mild about it. It's kind of like pre-diabetes. Pre, really? <laughs> but it's a different topic. Let's get back to the slides, shall we? Okay, moving on. As much as I like the phrase type three diabetes, because it really hammers home the fact that maybe there's something going on here with glucose, what, what type three diabetes does is it maybe puts the emphasis on glucose and it doesn't put it on insulin. 
right? So the issue is it's it's not just high glucose. So you might be thinking, well, gosh, you know, grandpa has Alzheimer's, but he's not diabetic or, you know, mom, mom has dementia, but her blood sugar is perfectly normal. You can have perfectly normal blood sugar, but very, very high insulin. I talk about this a lot on, on the rest of my YouTubes that are just more about low carb and keto diets and blood sugar and all that. Um, but there are quite literally millions of people out there who have totally normal blood sugar, but the reason their blood sugar is normal is because very, very high insulin is keeping it in check. But regardless of whether your blood sugar is high or not, the high insulin by itself can cause a large number of, of health problems. And this is the short list. This list could probably be three times as long and include things that chronically high insulin or hyperinsulinemia, what that either directly causes or makes worse. And if you've ever heard of metabolic syndrome, that's basically what this is. It's chronically high insulin. So any any one of these conditions that you see here, I, I won't go into detail because we've got so much more to cover. But the point is, it's not it's not always the, the blood sugar. Sometimes it's the insulin. And those of you that are old enough to remember that phrase from, I think it was the 70s or 80s, it's the economy, stupid. I like to say it's the insulin, stupid. So... Let's look a little more closely at hyperinsulinemia, the problem of this chronically elevated insulin and, and, and its contribution to Alzheimer's disease. Insulin resistance is usually at or near the top of the list of known lifestyle related factors heightening the risk of declining cognition in the elderly. Insulin resistance is usually at or near the top. The risk of, oh, they did a study where they took people that did not have Alzheimer's disease. And they followed them over a number of years and they saw who, who did develop Alzheimer's disease. And they looked for differences in, in the people who did develop Alzheimer's versus the people who did not. And what they found is that the risk of Alzheimer's disease doubled in the 39% of the people who had hyperinsulinemia and it was highest in people without diabetes. This is exactly what I was just explaining a minute ago. These people did not have diabetes, but they had very high insulin. And they had almost they had double the risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Insulin resistance may be a marker of Alzheimer's risk that is associated with the reduced cerebral metabolic rate of glucose. That's what CMR glue is, and subtle cognitive impairments at the earliest stage of disease even before the onset of mild cognitive impairment. The insulin resistance is the first domino to fall. That chronically high insulin is the first step in this disease process. The memory loss and the cognitive impairment and the personality changes and all that are the symptoms. The disease of Alzheimer's is the brain fuel starvation. It is the hyperinsulinemia ultimately leading to a brain fuel starvation. That is the disease. The memory loss is the symptom. That's really important to understand because it, it has implications for therapies and medications. If we don't understand the actual underlying problem in the disease, then we're never going to actually fix the disease. We're never going to prevent it. We're never going to cure it. We're never going to reverse it. If, if we don't understand the disease, we're just going to treat symptoms. And that's exactly what's going on. We'll talk about that in a bit. But this chronically elevated insulin is the canary in the coal mine. This is our earliest first signal as to the fact that there may be a problem going on. Okay. You've heard of metabolic syndrome. I said earlier, that's a, another name. I mean, it's not a, not formally recognized as another name, but chronically high insulin or hyperinsulinemia is the underlying issue in metabolic syndrome. And they, they now, the associations between this chronically elevated insulin, between metabolic syndrome and cognitive impairment are so strong, the links are so strong that they now call it metabolic cognitive syndrome. I didn't make this up. This, this is all from the published scientific literature here. Look, we've got the insulin resistant brain state. 
If any of you watching happen to be familiar with Dr. Thomas Seyfried out of, I think he's at Boston College, doing really, really fascinating research on metabolic therapies for cancer, metabolic treatment for cancer. Well, if there are metabolic therapies for cancer, maybe we, maybe we need a metabolic approach for Alzheimer's disease, for the metabolic cognitive syndrome. Paper after paper, this is everywhere. Insulin resistance and Alzheimer's disease. Targeting the insulin signaling pathway during early Alzheimer's cognitive impairment represents a viable therapeutic opportunity based upon solid empirical evidence that insulin resistance, Alzheimer's disease pathology, and related cognitive decline are mechanistically interrelated. Alzheimer's is a metabolic problem. You, you can't talk about Alzheimer's disease without talking about the ApoE4 gene. If um, many of you are probably familiar with the ApoE4 gene, especially if you're interested in the subject of Alzheimer's disease. So ApoE4 is the strongest known genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. If you, you know, we get two copies of every gene, we get one from our mother, one from our father. If you have one copy of the ApoE4 gene, you are at increased risk for Alzheimer's. If you have two copies of the ApoE4 gene, you are at exponentially increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. But not everybody who has Alzheimer's disease has the ApoE4 gene. And there's lots and lots of people who have the ApoE4 gene, even two copies, and they never develop Alzheimer's disease. So if we have people with the gene who never get Alzheimer's, and we have people who don't have the gene and they do get Alzheimer's, then this cannot be the cause. It can make you more susceptible. It can increase risk, but it doesn't cause the disease. Oops, sorry, need to share my slides again. Oops. Okay, sorry about that. So something to know is that it should, it should be noted that E4 is not an inherently damaging allele. It is only deleterious in combination with a high carb diet, which is deleterious on its own. Now, something I forgot to mention is that the ApoE4 gene is believed to be the oldest variant of the ApoE gene. There's a, there's two, three, and four within humans. I think in other animals, there's other variants of this ApoE gene. But in humans, there's ApoE2, 3, and 4. And ApoE4 is believed to be the oldest one. So it's believed that that gene evolved or was forged, if you will, during an evolutionary time when our diet and lifestyle were radically different from how they are today. One of the biggest difference, and a lot of differences, one of the biggest is in the amount and the type of carbohydrate that we eat. So um, researchers speculate that this gene is just a mismatch for the modern diet and lifestyle. The people with this gene are suited to, to a diet that was ve ve just that's very different from how we eat now. So the gene by itself is not a problem. The gene doesn't cause Alzheimer's, but when you mix it, when you put it into this modern diet and lifestyle that it is such a bad match for, that's when we have problems, right? Nobody's, nobody's genetically programmed to get Alzheimer's. Nobody's destined to get Alzheimer's. It's just that this gene is a, a, a very severe mismatch for the way that we eat and live in the modern world today. So same, same kind of thinking in the second quote here on ApoE4, the ApoE epsilon 4 allele may not be inherently damaging, but only in combination with a high carbohydrate diet, which is damaging in itself. That's what a lot of my other videos are about and is likely to be a major contributor to the high risk of coronary artery disease and possibly Alzheimer's in modern populations with or without the ApoE4 allele, right? I said that earlier. You, 
not everybody with Alzheimer's disease has ApoE4. So whether you have ApoE4 or not, eating the newfangled wackadoodle modern diet is harmful for us regardless of our ApoE genotype. Can't talk about Alzheimer's without ApoE4. Can't talk about Alzheimer's without the amyloid. And I, I give this talk on stage sometimes and I always ask the audience, what, what is this, this fish? What is this red fish doing in the middle of my presentation? What? And usually there's some astute people in the audience and they say, it's a red herring. Yes, this is a red herring. And what do I mean? when I say that the amyloid is a red herring. We need to look at this a little more deeply. If you are interested in Alzheimer's disease or you are afflicted with it yourself or a loved one is, you have no doubt heard of amyloid plaque. Amyloid is a protein that is secreted by the neurons and it's secreted by other cells too. And this is a perfectly normal process. Healthy brains produce amyloid. So everybody's brain produces amyloid. The problem in Alzheimer's disease is that these amyloid proteins are not cleared away properly. So instead of being cleared away efficiently, they accumulate and they build up and they start to cross link with each other, forming these infamous amyloid plaques. And these plaques build up outside the cells and they are insoluble, meaning they're like, they're hard. They don't, dissolve. I mean, that's an unscientific way to explain it, but it's like these plaques that build up outside the cell. And you remember the visuals of the cells from earlier. If you've got all this gunk, that, that is the scientific term. No, just kidding. You've got all this plaque building up outside these neurons. Well, yeah, no wonder they can't communicate. No, no wonder they're not talking to each other properly. And those of you that are old enough, who remembers the movie Spaceballs? I just joke and it's I shouldn't joke about this at all, but think of it, you know, when they say we've been jammed when their their um, satellite dish or their their receiver got the big thing of grape jelly on it. So this is like your communication system has been jammed with this plaque. Your, your cells can no longer communicate properly. So the plaque is a problem. It is a problem when this amyloid builds up and accumulates and forms these plaques. But that is not the cause of Alzheimer's disease. I'm gonna say it again, amyloid plaque is not the cause of Alzheimer's disease. It is an issue, it's not the cause. So see here, again, just illustrations, not to scale or anything, but we've got a normal neuron, a normal healthy neuron, and then we've got a neuron that's surrounded by these plaques. Low regional cerebral metabolic rate of glucose appears to be a very early event in the disease process, well before any clinical signs of dementia are evident, and well before cell loss or plaque deposition is predicted to have occurred. The amyloid plaque formation and buildup is actually a late stage in this disease. It's a late player. Remember the first step the first domino to fall is that hyperinsulinemia and or the reduced cerebral rate, the, the reduced cerebral uptake and use of glucose. I said that this is measurable. The reduced brain glucose metabolism is measurable in people at risk in their 30s and 40s. So long before there's any plaque, this plaque is a late comer to the game. And we have, let's see, we have... Just like with ApoE4, the fascinating thing, and some of you probably have never heard this before, but some people with Alzheimer's do not have a lot of plaque deposition. And then there's other people who do have a lot of plaque buildup who do not have Alzheimer's. And they only really look at this upon autopsy when they can actually dissect and look at your brain. And Again, they, this is what they find. There are people who die with no signs or symptoms of Alzheimer's. They, no one, they, they didn't have any cognitive problems, and yet their brains were riddled with amyloid plaque. And then we've got lots and lots of people who did die from Alzheimer's, and yet when their brains are examined, they did not have a lot of plaque buildup. So obviously this plaque is not causing the disease or 
it's not a major cause. It's not the first cause. And there are many drugs, a lot of drugs have been developed to reduce the formation of the plaque or to help clear the moid. They're called anti-amyloid drugs. There have been numerous of these types of drugs developed so far. Every single one of them has been a colossal failure. Now, they are successful in that these drugs do typically reduce the amyloid. They can decrease the amyloid, but decreasing the amyloid has never been demonstrated to actually improve cognitive function or cognitive performance. And it has never been shown to slow the progression of this disease, let alone stop it in its tracks or, or make it better, reverse it, not once. In fact, there was a drug, an anti-amyloid drug several years ago, and the phase three clinical trial had to be stopped early because the people on the drug, on the drug to reduce amyloid, were faring so much worse than the people on the placebo that it was deemed unethical to continue. So every time we go after this amyloid, people get worse. Targeting the amyloid has never ever made Alzheimer's disease better. Okay, back to the slides. I just, I, I cannot emphasize that enough, really. Is amyloid protective? Why, why is the brain secreting amyloid? And why, why do some people with, with Alzheimer's, why do they have so much amyloid? Well, many of you have probably heard the name Dale Bredesen. His work is a bit controversial. He's considered a quack in some circles, but so are a lot of the keto doctors we know and love. I have a great deal of respect for Dr. Bredesen. I think his research is really fascinating. Um, I think I think a lot remains to be discovered, but certainly what he's doing is fascinating and groundbreaking. So this is from Dr. Bredesen. The production of the amyloid is a protective response the idea of just getting rid of the amyloid without understanding why it's there actually makes very little biological sense. I agree, Dr. Bredesen. The formation of, that's beta amyloid shorthand, the formation of beta amyloid may actually be an element in the brain's defense against oxidative stress. Oxidative stress may provoke the protective release of beta amyloid. Oxidative stress is among the best inducers, and that's the APP, the amyloid precursor protein expression and consequent production of beta amyloid. Enzymatic release of beta amyloid from the amyloid precursor protein under conditions of neuronal stress. It's thought to be aimed at reducing oxidative stress, preventing cell death and promoting neurite outgrowth and tissue regeneration. Neurite outgrowth, like I've talked about those neurons with the Axons and dendrites, it's believed to be trying to promote. Now, can I nerd out for a second? Can I get really nerdy with you? I just wanna show you something really fascinating. Some of you may not be able to follow this. That's fine, just bear with me till we move on. Those of you science geeks out there are going to love this. If the main problem in Alzheimer's disease is that the brain is not taking up and using glucose properly, well, what's going on? Well, we've got, you know, this is a metabolic pathway here. We've got glucose and it gets converted to pyruvate and that's just glycolysis. And then, and you can see this is, this is the mitochondria. So that orange kind of border, this is inside the mitochondria, all this is happening. So glucose gets converted to pyruvate. Pyruvate goes into the mitochondria there. And that is combining with some other stuff to make ATP. ATP energy, again, if you remember from that beloved high school biology class, it's, it's how we make energy from glucose. One of the things amyloid, and, and you see where it says, so sorry, I got ahead of myself. That's what we're looking at, the conversion of glucose to acetyl-CoA into energy. This PDC circled in red is the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. It is an enzyme system that is needed to in, in the conversion of glucose to energy. And one of the things amyloid does is it blocks this enzyme or it inhibits the activity of this enzyme. And so here we think, oh my gosh, 
if amyloid is preventing this metabolism of glucose, well, no wonder there's a problem. And, and amyloid is causing the problem here, right? Oh my gosh, amyloid is blocking the conversion of glucose to energy. No, that, that's a logical thing to think, but I, the amyloid may actually be trying to protect the brain. The how do I say this in a in a simple way? If if the brain is already damaged in some way from decades upon decades of chronically high blood sugar and chronically high insulin, then the amyloid may be doing the brain a favor by putting the brakes on the glucose metabolism. The amyloid may be saying, "Oh, whoa there, whoa there." We were already damaged. We don't want any more glucose. Get this glucose out of here. So it by, by shutting off the glucose spigot, I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing here, but again, the amyloid may be doing something protective for the brain. Now, we're going to get to this in a little more detail in, in a bit, but if there were some other fuel source available, this would not be that big a crisis if the brain, if the glu if the metabolism of glucose was reduced or impaired. Because, okay, maybe we can't use glucose, but is there some other fuel we can turn to instead? Can we switch and use some other fuel? In most people, the answer is no, but we're, we're gonna come to that because the answer is actually yes, but only under certain circumstances. But my point is, that amyloid may be trying to protect the brain. And the only reason it's not actually protective is because there's no alternative fuel. So when we stop the metabolism of glucose, the brain is out of energy. And of course, we're going to have cognitive impairment as a result of that. So going along just more to really, really hammer this home that the amyloid is is not the cause and treating the amyloid and targeting the amyloid with drugs is just a waste of money. It's a waste of research effort. It's, in my opinion, criminal to be, and it is just my opinion again, but criminal to be charging people and charging insurance companies so much money for these drugs when these drugs are frankly useless. I'm sorry, but they're useless. The possibility must be considered that the current therapies designed around the bulk removal of beta amyloid may not simply fail, but be actively harmful by hindering the very functionality they hope to preserve, right? If amyloid is actually protective in some way and we're using drugs to decrease it, yikes, that's, that's the opposite of what we want, right? Millions of research dollars, both private and public, are annually ex annually expended on anti-amyloid therapies that do not work and are based on a logically flawed hypothesis. At this point in time, it is no longer unreasonable to suggest that further iterations of anti-amyloid therapies may not be in the best interest of late onset Alzheimer's patients. You got that right, because all the millions and millions of dollars that are being spent on this failed pathway could be redirected towards something far more promising. The amyloid cascade hypothesis is no longer supported by the majority of experimental evidence, if it ever was. This is a great paper on this stuff. During Alzheimer's disease, while beta amyloid accumulation may occur may occur in the long term in parallel with disease progression, it does not contribute to primary pathogenesis. This view predicts that amyloid-centric therapies will continue to fail. Yes, they will, sadly. But remember, yeah, amyloid accumulation may occur in the long term in parallel with disease progression, because as the disease is getting worse and worse, maybe the brain is making more and more amyloid to try to protect itself but it does not contribute to the primary pathogenesis. Why? Because we have lots of people with amyloid who don't have Alzheimer's. And remember, we have people who do have Alzheimer's who do not have a lot of amyloid. The thing that happens long, long before the amyloid buildup is the reduction in brain glucose metabolism and the hyperinsulinemia. So let's 
let's talk about insulin again for a minute because it is very related to the amyloid. So if let's say, let's say the amyloid is a problem because I said, normal healthy brains produce amyloid. There's nothing wrong with producing amyloid. That's a normal physio physiological process. The problem in Alzheimer's disease is that it's not cleared away properly. It's as if the sanitation crew is on strike, right? It's not, it's, and, and because it's not cleared away, it just builds up and builds up and forms these plaques. And when these plaques are formed, that does interfere with neuronal communication. So I'm not saying the amyloid is never a problem at all. I'm saying it's there for a reason and clearing it away can sometimes be problematic, but why isn't it being cleared away? If the problem is not that amyloid exists or is being generated, it's that it's building up and forming these plaques. Why is it building up? Well, how interesting, I'm about to blow your mind. Hang on to your seat here. Under hyperinsulinemic conditions, insulin competes with beta amyloid for insulin degrading enzyme, leading to the accumulation of beta amyloid and senile plaque formation. When, when hormones and other things are in our blood and, and or they, they've kind of done their job, they can't just hang out there forever. They have to be cleared away. And so one of the things that clears insulin away is no surprise insulin degrading enzyme or ide it this enzyme degrades insulin and clears it away but ide this insulin degrading enzyme doesn't only clear away insulin it clears away amyloid what when i first found that out i about fell out of my chair i really did insulin competes with amyloid for insulin degrading enzyme. And I explain it sometimes this way, think of it as, so enzymes have different substrates, different things that they work on, different sort of targets. And think of it like a parent that has more than one child. Let's say you have two or three children and whether or not you actually have a favorite child, let's pretend you don't you don't pick favorites. You love your children all equally. They're your angels, they're your darlings. Enzymes are not like that. Enzymes do have favorite children. Enzymes do play favorites. The, the favorite child, if you will, of insulin degrading enzyme is insulin. So when there's so much insulin, right? I've been emphasizing this chronically high insulin. When there's so much insulin, then it's it's thought maybe that this insulin degrading enzyme is too busy, so to speak, again, using really scientific language here, the, the insulin degrading enzyme is basically occupied dealing with all the insulin, thus leaving the amyloid behind to accumulate. And this is, this is all sort of speculative, but mechanistically, it makes sense. Like physiologically, biochemically, it makes sense. So ju just remember that, that insulin competes with beta amyloid for this insulin degrading enzyme. Insulin degrading enzyme, a major amyloid degrading enzyme might be competitively inhibited by insulin. Yeah, meaning insulin, insulin is competing with the amyloid and because the insulin wins, then the insulin degrading enzyme is basically inhibited from going after the amyloid. So it results in decreased amyloid degradation. It was shown that elevated insulin levels in type 2 diabetes induce beta amyloid accumulation through competition between insulin and amyloid for insulin degrading enzyme. Okay, we've covered a lot. Let's tone down the, the science for a little, well, not the science, but like the, the high level complex stuff and talk about some stuff that's a little more simple and real world stuff to understand. What else can get in the way of healthy cognitive function? Because I've talked a lot about the contribution of this chronically high insulin and the metabolic syndrome, metabolic cognitive syndrome angle. But there are a lot of other things that can contribute to cognitive impairment or cognitive decline. One of them is prescription antacids. And I am not by any stretch saying here 
that prescription antacids or over-the-counter antacids cause Alzheimer's. But what they do is reduce nutrient absorption. That's what these drugs do. They reduce the production of stomach acid or they neutralize the acid that's already been produced. Different types of antacids have different mechanisms of action. The point is all of them impair your body's ability to properly digest your food and absorb the nutrients from the food, especially B12. Vitamin B12 is critical for healthy neurological function and for cognitive function. And vitamin B12 deficiency is rampant. And I think it is wickedly underdiagnosed. Part of it is that the test just isn't run all that often. I, I think it should be a standard test. I think above age 50, it should be a routine part of a physical or, or a checkup, just standard. The way they do a fasting blood sugar, they should just check your B12, just period, end of story. Another problem with why B12 deficiency is so underdiagnosed is that the reference range is far too wide. The reference range is about nine miles wide and it, it needs to be a lot tighter. There are some B12 experts who think that if you're, you know, if you're at the low end of normal and you have neurological or cognitive symptoms, consider yourself deficient. They like for people to be at the midpoint of the reference range or higher, whatever the units are, there's different units in different countries or different labs. You, you don't want to be at the low end of the reference range, particularly if you are already exhibiting neurological or cognitive symptoms. Anyway, yeah. So the point is these proton pump inhibitors, these, these antacid drugs are bad juju for your body to absorb nutrients. They, they, there, there is increased risk for Alzheimer's disease with long-term use of these drugs. That's where these studies come from. The increased risk is small. I'm not going to blow smoke up you know where to you people watching my video. Thank you for watching. But th there is an increased risk, but it's small, but it's there. And we know that there is actually a significantly increased risk for long-term use of these drugs and bone fractures and other things because of reduced absorption of things like magnesium. So we know for certain that these drugs do impair nutrient absorption, which I don't know why that wouldn't interfere with cognitive function, frankly. We have to talk about statins. Your brain is built out of cholesterol. Your brain is loaded with cholesterol. I think the figure is something like 25% of all the cholesterol in your entire body is in your brain. Just, just here, just here. You know, some of us more than others, no, just kidding. Your, your brain is loaded with cholesterol. All of that myelin, it's largely made out of cholesterol. Every single cell membrane, every axon, every dendrite, every little piece of a neuron needs cholesterol. So what happens when we reduce the body's production of cholesterol? We get, we get cholesterol from food a little bit, but the, the vast majority of cholesterol in our bodies is made by our bodies. So this comes directly, you can see on the slide, directly from the US FDA website, verbatim. Information about the potential for generally non-serious and reversible cognitive side effects, memory loss, confusion, and reports, and reports of increased blood sugar and glycosylated hemoglobin have been added to statin labels. FDA continues to believe that the cardiovascular benefits of statins outweigh these small increased risks. We'll talk about the cardiovascular benefits of statins some other time. That's not what we're here for right now. But generally non-serious cognitive side effects, memory loss and confusion. If I'm, if, if I'm losing my marbles and I'm confused all the time, I think that's pretty serious. I don't know who's calling that non-serious. I guess the FDA is. But, and, and of course that is well documented now that statins increased risk for type two diabetes, and there's numerous mechanisms as to why. Again, that's not what we're talking about right now, but that is a thing. This is also, again, directly from the FDA's website. Memory loss and confusion have been reported with statin use. These reported events were, again, generally not serious and went away once the drug was no longer being taken. That's what they tell the patients. Here's what they tell the healthcare professionals. There have been rare post-marketing reports of cognitive impairment, 
memory loss, forgetfulness, amnesia, memory impairment, and confusion associated with statin use. These reported symptoms are generally not serious and reversible upon statin discontinuation. Okay, again, they are serious, first of all. Second of all, okay, they're reversible upon statin discontinuation. How many doctors tell their patients to stop taking a statin? If anything, it's almost the opposite. Don't you dare stop that statin. You'll have a heart attack in two minutes. Don't you dare stop that drug. You need this drug. Your cholesterol is like two milligrams per deciliter over the limit, whatever. And not a doctor. This is not medical advice. That was just a little aside rant. The point is your brain absolutely requires cholesterol for healthy neuronal and neurological and cognitive function. So of course, when we take a drug that reduces the body's capacity to synthesize cholesterol, of course, we have neurological problems. Of course, we have cognitive impairment. Now, there are certain types of statins that cause this more than others. There are particular types of statins that cross the blood-brain barrier more readily than others. And it's the ones that cross the blood-brain barrier more readily that haven't in, an even greater potential to cause these types of memory problems. And I don't remember which ones they are at the moment. You can, you can look them up online. They would be called lipophilic. Lipophilic statins are the ones that get, well, they more readily cross the blood brain barrier. I'll just leave it at that. So not, not, I think all statins come with this risk, but there are some that have a higher potential risk. We don't necessarily want to be reducing cholesterol willy-nilly all the time. Hi, now, th these are associations here. This is not ironclad evidence, but it's just interesting to note that high LDL cholesterol is inversely associated with mortality in most people over 60. Our analysis provides a reason to question the validity of the cholesterol hypothesis. High LDL inversely associated with mortality, meaning the when your cholesterol is higher, no, I want to say when your cholesterol is high, higher, you live longer. Yeah, high LDLC inversely associated. So the higher your LDL, the less likely your risk of dying at any given point. And the lower your LDLC, the greater your risk for mortality. Non demented elderly with levels of total cholesterol, non HDLC, and LDL in the lowest quartile were approximately twice as likely to die as those in the highest quartile. And again, this is associational. We cannot say this is cause and effect, but certainly people with the, the lowest cholesterol had, had greater risk for death than the people in the, in the, who had the highest cholesterol. And I don't like the way this is phrased, but this is how they do it in the scientific literature. The fact is we all, have 100% chance of mortality. So nobody's mortality is reduced. No, Nobody's risk of death is reduced. We're all going to die. But they just mean at any given point, you know, your risk of dying from anything but a nice, healthy old age. But I, I did have to point that out. I don't like when they say, you know, reduced mortality. No, no, we all have 100% risk of mortality so far as we know anyway. I know there's a lot of biohackers trying to maybe not make that the case, but We'll leave them to it. High cholesterol in late life was associated with decreased dementia risk. Findings suggest that cholesterol levels within the high normal range are associated with better cognitive performance in the Chinese elderly, this was a study out of China. Low cholesterol may serve as a clinical indicator of risk for cognitive impairment in the elderly, meaning when we see very elderly people with very low cholesterol, they might have a high risk of Dementia, cognitive problems. Okay, been going on and on and on. What are we going to do about this? The good news is there is something we can do. We are not powerless. We are not helpless. We are not clueless. There is a lot that we don't know about Alzheimer's. There are a lot of unanswered questions, but that doesn't mean we don't know anything. Just because we don't know everything doesn't mean we don't know enough and that we know enough to start taking some potentially helpful actions. So let's see what some of those actions might be.
Alzheimer's disease may be similar to obesity, coronary artery disease, and type 2 diabetes in being a consequence of the conflict between our paleolithic genetic constitution and our current Neolithic diet. This is what I said earlier about that ApoE4 gene. That ApoE4 gene is the oldest in the human family. It evolved or was forged in a time when our lifestyle, in particular our diet, was radically different from what it is today. So it may be that Alzheimer's is simply a result of this dietary and lifestyle evolutionary mismatch. I've been saying all along that the fundamental problem in Alzheimer's disease is that the brain is starving for energy. And it's starving for energy specifically because it has become unable to take up and metabolize glucose. So, okay, the brain is, is impaired in its capacity to get energy from glucose. Is there some other fuel? Do we, do we have an alternative type of fuel that we could maybe give the brain? The answer is a resounding yes. The, the brain is like a hybrid car. Your whole body is like a hybrid car. We can run on different kinds of fuel. And those of you who watch my keto and low carb videos know where we're going with this. But yes, the good news is there is an alternative fuel that we can give the brain and it's called ketones. Like when you're on a ketogenic diet, there's other ways to get ketones too. We'll come to that in a minute. Throughout much of human evolution, ketosis likely served as a valuable survival mechanism to fuel brain metabolism during times of food scarcity. And I would argue during times of carbohydrate unavailability, like maybe during the winter up in very northern latitudes or, or very high altitudes when there's not a lot of fruit to be had, not a lot of starchy things to be had, just basically a, a lower carb, higher fat, higher protein diet. So a val ketosis likely served as a valuable survival mechanism to fuel brain metabolism during times of food scarcity and carbohydrate unavailability. Hence, in some ways, the modern diet can be considered keto deficient. That is one of my all time favorite lines in all of the Alzheimer's published literature. The modern diet can be considered keto deficient. And that's from a researcher named Sam Henderson. And I've had the honor and privilege of meeting Sam Henderson. In fact, I was giving a talk years ago and I had this quote, and I think I, I've cited a bunch of his other research. You may have seen the Henderson citation a few times in this presentation. And I was signing books afterward and who came up to me to introduce himself, but Sam Henderson, he was in the audience. I. I felt like I was meeting Bon Jovi and I even said that to him and his wife was there and I said like you didn't know your husband was such a rock star did you I mean I this his I'm just a huge fan his research in Alzheimer's is so fascinating and not only to have met him but to think that he attended my talk I mean this is a person whose papers I've been reading for a decade right and good thing I had only praises to sing good thing I only said good things about his research right but anyway let's get back to the talk shall we so that's one of my very favorite quotes. The next one is probably just a little above. So you're seeing on this one slide, two of my very, very favorite things that I've ever read about Alzheimer's. And this one is from Dr. Stephen Cunane from uh, a Canadian university, also the most fascinating research on ketones and brain metabolism and Alzheimer's disease. Two points are clear. Alzheimer's disease is at least in part exacerbated by, if not actually caused by, chronic progressive brain fuel starvation due specifically to brain glucose deficit. And attempting to treat the cognitive deficit early in Alzheimer's disease using ketogenic interventions is safe, ethical, and scientifically well-founded. Using ketogenic interventions is safe, ethical, and scientifically well-founded. Or did I mess up that quote? What did he say? Something like that, right? Yes. In my opinion, this is the most promising, most heartening, most encouraging thing 
going on in Alzheimer's research today. And in fact, the Alzheimer's Association, I think, has actually given Dr. Cunane some grants. So they have funded some of his research in ketogenic therapies for Alzheimer's disease. So I don't know why this major, major critical discussion of brain glucose deficit is not plastered all over the Alzheimer's Association website, but that's just me. I'm not their webmaster. Um, but again, the, the major underlying problem in the brain of somebody with Alzheimer's disease is that the brain is starving for energy because for whatever reason, it is not using glucose. And so could we at least give it another fuel? Could we power these otherwise starving, struggling neurons with another fuel in the form of ketones? And indeed we can. And people, you can't close that gap 100%. So far, ketones have not been shown to do that, but they can close it a little bit. And that's better than nothing. And that's better than any anti-amyloid drug or, or cholinesterase inhibitor. It's another type of... Am uh, Alzheimer's drug, it, it inhibits the acetylcholinesterase, um, sorry, enzyme in the brain. Also, not that effective, really doesn't do much to actually slow or stop the disease progression. So let's, let's get back to things. But this really, truly, in my opinion, is so much more encouraging than chasing the amyloid. And, and it really targets the actual problem more so than any of these other drugs ever do. So remember what I said earlier that the amyloid might be protective and it might be trying to do the brain a favor by shutting off that glucose spigot. Hey, we're so damaged already from so many years of glucose and insulin problems. Like we don't want any more glucose. That would be fine if ketones were available. Right. If there was an alternative fuel available, this wouldn't be as big a crisis. But in most people on a high carb diet, there are no ketones because we typically only produce ketones when we are fasting or starving or on a very, very low carbohydrate diet. And most people are not following a very low carbohydrate diet. Remember what Dr. Henderson said, the modern diet can be considered keto deficient. Most people are hardly ever in ketosis anymore when thousands of years ago, it was probably a very natural state for the body to be in. So this, again, one of my favorite papers, beta amyloid compromises glucose utilization, but without providing ketone bodies as an alternative fuel, what is meant to be a survival program is perverted into a death program. If the ketone bodies were there as an alternative fuel, this wouldn't be quite as big a problem. I just said that normally we only produce ketones when we are fasting, starving, or on a very low carbohydrate diet. Some people will have very, very mild elevation of ketones after an intense workout. So like very young, athletic, fit people can sometimes be, transiently be in a mild state of ketosis just from exercise. But not most people. So if ketones can serve as an alternative fuel to glucose and potentially fuel these starving brain cells, how do we get ketones? I just said, keep low carb diet, ketogenic diet. If somebody can do this diet, great. I literally specialize in helping people to do just that. But some it's, it's hard enough for some people to stick to a ketogenic diet when they're young and healthy and they genuinely want to do it for whatever reasons they may be doing it. Even then, it can be really hard to actually stick to it. Now take someone who's got cognitive impairment or maybe they're belligerent. You know, they don't understand why you're taking away their bagel and jelly and all, you know, and, and you're forcing them to eat eggs and bacon or a, a ham and cheese omelet. Like, so it, it can be very difficult to get somebody to adhere to this diet. That's the best way to do it. But if somebody is unwilling or unable to adhere to a ketogenic diet, can we still get them some ketones? Yes. Fasting, of course, will raise ketones. Gen generally, we don't want older people fasting, especially if they're already frail or underweight or malnourished, as a lot of elderly people are. If that's not the situation with somebody you may be 
watching this for or concerned about a loved one, please have medical supervision. Please work with, you know, a medical professional and a nutrition professional who know what they're doing. But generally for an older person, if they are frail, malnourished or underweight, we don't want them fasting and making it worse. What about exercise? I just mentioned that exercise can transiently raise those ketones, but most elderly people or people with Alzheimer's, so even younger people, if they have Alzheimer's, they're probably not going to be doing those HIIT workouts, right? Those high intensity interval trainings. So what about coconut oil and MCT oil? Many of you are familiar with this, I'm sure, but just in case, the MCT is medium chain triglyceride. There are special types of fats that your body will convert into ketones even when you're not on a ketogenic diet. And so these, these, these particular types of special fats are found in many different products, but they're, they're especially highly concentrated in coconut oil and MCT oil is just these special types of fats, these medium chain fats. And so if you use coconut oil or MCT oil in your foods, beverages, whatever, you will actually have ketones. Your body will have some circulating ketones to get to the brain, even if you're still eating a high carb diet. Same thing with exogenous ketones. Exogenous ketones are sort of a ketone supplement. They're, they're mostly used in, uh, sorry, they mostly come as a powder that you mix in a beverage and you just drink it. And they, they have ketone esters as well. Now it's just a different form. It's much um, more potent, I guess. It tends to raise the ketone level much higher than the, the powder, the, what they call the ketone salts, the powders. And I had an asterisk by the coconut oil, MCT oil, and the exogenous ketones. And that is because these things will raise ketones. Again, even so the exogenous ketones, just like the MCT oil, even if somebody's eating a high carb diet, you can raise their ketone levels by giving them the exogenous ketones. So the exogenous ketones and the MCT oil will raise the ketone level and it will provide the brain with a little bit of energy. And that's exactly what we want. But those do nothing to fix the fundamental underlying metabolic problems that I think and that some of this literature indicates are causing the cognitive impairment in the first place, right? If Alzheimer's is a, a longer term result of chronically high blood sugar and or insulin, then giving the exogenous ketones or the MCT oil will help close that little fuel gap a bit, but it's not doing anything to fix the underlying cause. And so something like a ketogenic diet, which helps to improve insulin sensitivity, helps to sort of reverse that insulin resistance, that actually does target the underlying metabolic disturbances that are causing this. So I, I in, in my book, The Alzheimer's Antidote, I use the analogy that giving the coconut oil or the MCT oil or giving exogenous ketones is like bailing water out of a leaky boat without stopping to patch the hole. You're just managing the symptoms. You're managing that symptom in the short term without actually addressing the problem. Now, in somebody who is very, very severely impaired or really, really elderly, or there's somebody who's never, ever gonna follow a ketogenic diet. I mean, forget it, there's no chance. Yes, absolutely. Give them the exogenous ketones, give them the MCT oil. Let's get this brain some fuel any which way we can. But if we want to actually make a dent in the cause, like so if somebody is in their 50s, in their 60s, they have this early onset situation or whatever age they're at, if it's kind of in a mild form, if it hasn't really progressed too far yet, do everything you can to correct the underlying metabolic situation. And it's not, it's not just the diet. I mean, there's sleep, there's exercise, there's all sorts of other things that I, I address in the book. This talk, I really wanted to focus on the diet and just the fundamental metabolic origins of Alzheimer's as a condition overall. I don't, the, this talk will be four hours if I, if I also get into, you know, stress management and sleep and all that. So maybe I'll do that some other time, but just wanted to cover the 
essentials here. So that's, those are my thoughts on the exogenous ketones. They can be helpful. I'm, I mentioned earlier in this presentation that, that soon I will be posting also a long video on ketogenic therapies for neurodegenerative conditions in general. So moving beyond Alzheimer's to Parkinson's, MS, and some others. And I will show you there some data of the actual clinical trials, because there are clinical trials showing that this is effective for improving. Does it reverse it entirely? No, but we've got a much, much better track record so far than any of the actual Alzheimer's drugs. This is very, very promising. People do have improvements in cognitive function on a ketogenic diet or with these other ketogenic therapies like MCT oil and the exogenous ketones. Okay, what else? Let's talk about the diet a little more here. I specifically say potential prevention via diet because I'm very, very careful with my language. I'm a writer at heart, words matter. I don't want to claim that for certain 100%, we can prevent Alzheimer's. I don't know if we can. I think we can. I believe we can. Because if this condition is coming primarily from metabolic syndrome, chronically high insulin, problems with blood sugar, then we should be able to prevent it. But I, I can't say for sure. So I say potential prevention. The primary event leading, leading to the development of Alzheimer's is consumption of an evolutionarily discordant diet. This hypothesis predicts that relatively simple preventative measures, such as lowering the consumption of starchy carbohydrates and increasing essential fatty acids in the diet will be effective. The inhibition of lipid metabolism, meaning burning fat and producing ketones, the inhibition of this metabolism by high carb diets, that's HC, may be the most detrimental aspect of modern diets. Therefore, reducing dietary intake of high glycemic carbs and increasing protein, fiber, and fat would be preferred. Yet, such a change would require dramatic decreases in carbohydrate intake to less than 30% of daily caloric intake, and frankly, much less than that, but it would be difficult to implement without drastic changes in dietary thinking. Yes, this would take a sea change in nutrition authority type organizations. They would have to stop singing the praises of all those healthy whole grains and those complex carbs. And they would for sure have to stop being so darn afraid of all that dastardly saturated fat, all that red meat that healthy, robust humans have been eating for thousands of years. They would have to finally stop being afraid of egg yolks and butter and all of these good, very low carb, high fat foods. Okay, so what does an anti-Alzheimer's diet look like? What does such a diet look like that helps to keep blood sugar and insulin low? It's certainly not a hardship. It's certainly not living on, I don't know, rice cakes and bean sprouts. This, this is sumptuous, wonderful, delicious food. This is not a punishment diet by any stretch of the imagination. It's, it's good high fat dairy products, it's seafood, it's meat, poultry, it's eggs, it's non-starchy vegetables. It's a very small amount of fruit for those who can tolerate that and still get the cognitive benefits they need. And I get this question very often, is it too late? Is it too late to change my diet? I'm 70 years old, I'm 80 years old, I'm 65, and I've been eating the standard American garbage my entire life. Is it too late? And I, I no, it's never too late. It's never too late to get healthy. It's never too late to eat a, a better, you know, nutritious, lower carb diet. I don't think it's ever too late. And I also get the question, do I have to do a ketogenic diet? Do I have to eat? keto? My answer is no, but it depends. So how do I explain this succinctly? The, the solution, the, the strategy that you need to reverse a problem or get out of a problem is not necessarily the same strategy you would use to prevent the problem from happening in the first place. Think of it like 
an exterminator. Let's say you have an insect infestation in your home, just bugs everywhere. Ooh. You can call the exterminator and they can come and set off a bug bomb and spray all this toxic stuff. And great, problem solved. Okay. But you could have prevented the infestation by maybe not keeping unsealed food out all the time, maybe making sure the seals around your doors and windows are all, you know, properly sealed. So kind of like, like with Alzheimer's, once you are in the throes of this condition, once your brain is already literally starving to death, I think you probably do need a ketogenic diet or, and or these other ketogenic modalities, the exogenous ketones, the MCT oil, these other things. But do you, do you need to eat a strict ketogenic diet to potentially prevent Alzheimer's? No, I don't think you do. You could eat that way if you wanted to. Lots and lots of people are doing keto for any number of reasons. If you enjoy eating keto, you, you can do that. I think that is a way to, again, potentially prevent or at least certainly reduce risk. That's what I should say, reduce risk, not, not even potentially prevent, let, reduce risk for Alzheimer's. But let's say you don't want to do strict keto. What you do have to do, in my opinion, based on all this science that I've shown you, is you have to live and eat in such a way that keeps your blood sugar and insulin within a healthy range. And the amount of carbohydrate that any one of us as an individual can consume and still achieve that, still keep our blood sugar and insulin within a healthy normal range is gonna be different. Some of, some of us will have to have a very, very low carbohydrate intake to maintain normal blood sugar and insulin levels. Some of us can have a lot more. Younger people, very, very athletic fit people tend to have a higher carbohydrate tolerance, but it really, really varies. My point is, I don't think you need an ultra strict keto diet, but if you, you do need to eat in such a way that controls blood sugar and insulin. And again, the other lifestyle stuff that I don't really want to talk about this time, the, you know, good quality and quantity sleep, restorative sleep, the, sorry. Not enough B12 for Amy's brain. Yeah, the sleep, the stress management. There's there's some other things. There's there's some particular supplements that can help. There's just other things that go into this. I'm really focusing today on the diet and the glucose insulin thing. So I can't say whether or not you need keto. You need a healthy diet and lifestyle. And what that means to any one individual is a little bit different from what it means to somebody else, right? Almost done. We're in the home stretch, I promise. Okay. I get asked often, what about other kinds of dementia? You know, people write to me, uh, you know, mom has Lewy body dementia. Dad has vascular dementia. There's a frontotemporal dementia. What about somebody with cognitive impairment after a traumatic brain injury or concussion or something? And there's less research on keto, there's actually a very fascinating uh, library, I guess, um, <clears throat> library of evidence, I'm sorry, of, of research looking at ketogenic diets and ketogenic therapies for traumatic brain injury. Very, very promising stuff. There's a lot less for things like that Lewy body dementia and the frontal temporal and all these other kinds of dementias, but I, I have yet to see, and if you tune in for when I post the video about the neurodegenerative conditions in general, I have yet to see a single one of these conditions that does not have some aspect of reduced brain or reduced neuronal glucose metabolism. Every single one of them has that as at least one aspect of the problem. So if that's an aspect of the problem, then it stands to reason that in any of those types of, of impairment scenarios, we would want to use ketones as an alternative fuel, that if the metabolism of glucose is impaired, let's have an alternative fuel that the brain will take up and use. And that's, that's really, I can't believe, I, I didn't even mention this part. When I said it's the most encouraging, promising thing, even though the brain has become compromised in its ability to take up and use glucose, it does still take up and use ketones 
And that's that's from Dr. Kunain's research. It's just the most fascinating stuff. The brain, the brain sucks up ketones like a champ. And I will show you some really impressive clinical evidence in that next video where of actual data coming in. I, I'm sorry I didn't do that, but how much longer do we want this video to be, right? So um for for any type of dementia, I think keto is worth trying. Nobody can guarantee what's going to happen, but here's what I say when people ask me all the time, is keto good for insert X condition? And we all, my, myself and most of the professionals I know will say, try it because it's either going to help a lot, it's going to help a little bit, or it might not help at all. It's very, very rare that a ketogenic diet makes something worse when it's done properly. There's a lot of wackadoodle, newfangled, unscientific things being promoted out there with regard to ketogenic diets. I mean, when it's done safely, when it's done in the proper way, it it almost never makes anything worse. So you, you have nothing to lose by trying because what you're doing now isn't working. What you're doing now isn't helping. So you really truly have nothing to lose except maybe a couple of months without bread and bagels and pasta, right? <laughs> okay. One last slide or two, I think. I just didn't want to forget to cover those other dementia issues because I do get that question a lot. Okay. There is hope. I, I really truly believe that there is something that we can do about Alzheimer's. We are not powerless. We are not helpless. Like I said, there is still a lot we don't know, but that doesn't mean we don't know anything. And it doesn't mean that we don't have enough knowledge to start taking potentially helpful actions. And I do think there are going to be some people who are too far gone. That is a thing. You're going to have people who are so severely impaired, their disease has progressed so far that even a ketogenic diet is not going to help. Exogenous ketones might, you never know. But that's why it's so important to start this kind of thing not not when the disease is really mild, but before you get it, take this seriously. And that doesn't mean you have to start a ketogenic diet, but it means you have to take your blood sugar and insulin really seriously. You have to take your food really seriously, whether or not you eat keto, eat a healthy diet that helps you maintain metabolic health. And if you if you have a family history of Alzheimer's disease, if you have a, the ApoE4 gene, whether you have one or two copies, you are not sentenced to get Alzheimer's disease. You are not destined to get this. I really do think there's something we can do about it. So if you want to learn more, there is more to learn, believe it or not. There's, there's a ton that I didn't cover in this talk, but again, this is my book, The Alzheimer's Antidote. It is available on Amazon or better yet, you know, contact your local independent bookseller and ask them to get you a copy. Feel free to contact me. This is what I do. If you want help, uh, my email address is there. If you are interested in booking a consultation, go to stallslayer.com and there's a tab that says work with me. Please follow me on social media if you want to know more about ketogenic interventions for these types of neurological and neurodegenerative things. Or I also help people with weight loss, with diabetes, with metabolic syndrome, PCOS, hypertension, the whole gamut of insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome type things. Not to mention, I'm actually working on my fourth book right now, which is all about thyroid. It's not a keto book at all. It's about thyroid. So follow me on the socials. As they say, I'm on Twitter at Two It Nutrition. I am on Facebook, Two It Nutrition LLC. And I have a YouTube channel, which you are on right now, but feel free to subscribe. I do keto without the crazy. And I really, really hope that's helpful. And keep an eye out for that upcoming video where I will be talking about ketogenic therapies for Alzheimer's and beyond those other conditions that I've mentioned. And there, that is the one where I will show you some numbers, show you some data, and you will see that this actually does work because it's all well and good for me to say, oh, just do a keto diet. Does it actually work? Don't tell me to do it if there's not. It does work. 
It does have a beneficial impact. Does it cure Alzheimer's? No. Does it help to improve cognitive performance? Yes. Learn more in that next video. And thank you so much for hanging in there with me. I appreciate it. I'll catch you next time.